today we're going to talk about this very interesting topic, reg regulation securities and antitrust regulation. And we're going to talk about antitrust first. Um, we don't, it's, and we're going to go through it very quickly because this is all about monopolies. In our country, uh, and here's your secretary, there may be one question at the end, maybe. But when we're talking about antitrust, we want to avoid businesses coming so big that they form a monopoly in a particular area. Like, let's say, hmm, the NFL, <laughs> the NCAA. Like every pan company, uh, they like market their prices like because they were the only people who had it. Well, I wouldn't say that's not, I'm not that's not necessarily a monopoly. This is a business that has the market cornered on that one product. But before then, there were other products that were similar to that product that did the same thing and it was keeping the price down. Well, yeah, but then their their whatever they had ran out. And so it, they, so that's that's not EpiPen's problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but these are what we want to stop is a business getting too big to fail, so to speak. That it's so big that it has just it it has just swamped the market. Nobody else can get in. Uh, and the purpose of antitrust law is to prevent, punish, and deter certain anti-competitive conduct and unfair business uh, practices. That's the point of this. Modern day antitrust enforcement is concerned primarily with protecting the competitive process rather than individual competitor companies. So the underlying theory is that protection of this process will ultimately benefit consumers and it will, because if you have AT&T buying up all of the uh, 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 cable companies, and now we have to go and purchase our cable from one company, what's going to happen to the price? It's going to go skyrocket. So to keep price low, we want to have competition. And the law that governs this is the Sherman Antitrust Act. This is in our book. And it's divided into two parts. First, the Sherman Antitrust Act prohibits every contract combination in the form of trust or otherwise or conspiracy and restraint of trade or commerce. And then the second part of the act covers monopolization and provides a remedy against every person who shall monopolize. I mean, this is the bulk, really, of where the problem usually comes in. Or attempt to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce among the several states. It's a federal statute. Monopolization. Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act was designed to prevent business monopolies but it does not prohibit a business entity from becoming a monopoly. Rather, the statute outlaws affirmative action towards monopolizing or attempting to monopolize a part of trade or commerce. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the commercial of the, the werewolf and his wife and they go to the school. Uh, the teacher has called them to the school because the daughter has drawn some pictures, mm -hmm. some unsavory items okay. in drawing class. <laughs> you haven't seen that? No. The husband and wife are there sitting there and, and the uh, teacher shows the picture that the daughter drew and it's just, and so there was some stickers, stickers all over the picture and the dad, he looks at it, the dad werewolf. <coughs> and this is a, uh, What's the name of that cable company? Spectrum. Spectrum. Now, they are in the process, they used to be Time Warner Cable. 
And they're and they're in the process of buying another company, aren't they? Well, they're, they were in the process of buying Comcast. Okay. So they shut it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So they're uh, so the the werewolf dad sees the picture and he says, "Oh, oh, I like those little <laughs> stickies all over there." And the teacher's like, "No, I'll put those on there to cover up all this bad language that your daughter drew on this picture." <laughs> And it was a picture that she had drawn because, you know, the dad, he's in there all the time complaining about the high price of their Spectrum cable. And the fact that, you know, the channels that he can't get and this and that and he just, and so, uh, and so he sees some of the words and he's like, well, I would never say any of these words. And his werewolf wife, she says, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm, yes, you do. <laughs> but she didn't come out and say it. And he's complaining because of, uh, you know, the price of the cable. I'm saying to myself, well, the companies that he's complaining about in a, in a, very soon, he's saying, you know, about these other companies, very soon this company is going to buy up that company. And I'm just trying to see how long they're going to run this commercial because soon some of the, they named some of the companies that they're in competition with in this commercial and I'm saying also how can they they're just planning on they're in the news they're planning on buying this other cable company and you're talking bad about them now you got the werewolf in there and he's cussing about the companies and, and the daughter's drawing the pictures and the teacher is like well y'all gonna have to take this home because I can't keep this here in the classroom with <laughs> with the kids and so that is the whole idea of monopolization. And then uh, your book talks about uh, a case, <clears throat> a what we call a landmark case. And so that's all we really need to know about uh, chapter 19. And obviously more of that information is um, in your slides. We're going to move into our securities and regulations of chapter 16. <clears throat> and our book gives us some definitions of securities transactions, and they let us know that they occur in two settings, the primary market. And we talked about this earlier when we were talking about uh, private companies and companies that go public. This is going to be uh, relating to that aspect of companies that are now go are on the public stock market. And we've heard of the stock exchange and all of that. These are securities. And so the primary market in which businesses sell original issues and reissues of securities to raise capital, we talked about this, to capitalize the business, that's the whole point of going public. And the secondary market in which investors buy or sell issue securities amongst themselves. Both of these markets are governed by federal and state securities laws. But for the most part, we're going to be looking more at federal today. And here are some definitions of securities. Stocks and bonds are perhaps the most well-known type of securities. In addition, partnership interests, stocks, options, warrants, agreements to invest, participation in pool of assets. These are some other types of securities. And then our book talks about the parties that are involved in these securities transactions. Investors. The investors are people who are seeking a return from their investment based on the value of the security. So when you're buying uh, a security or you're investing in a business, a business that needs to capitalize, obviously you are doing that for the purpose that you think that you're going to go in and buy this stock at a certain price and at some point it's going to increase in value at which time you will hurry up and sell it so that you can make a profit and then there are issuers who are those institutions and entities that sell securities to investors and then you have your intermediaries or financial institutions that provide services for investors and issuers related to securities transactions. So it is an entire market in and of itself, this whole idea of buying and selling stocks. And then your book talks about equity instruments. Your common stock, also called common shares, 
entitles the equity owner to payments based on the current profitability of the company while common stockholders uh, share in the profits. They also bear the greatest risk of loss because they are typically subordinate to all of the creditors. While you have your preferred stock, which is an alternative form of equity that has less risk than the common stock because it has certain quasi-debt features. A pervert is preferred stock. The biggest advantage of preferred stock is that preferred stockholders have preference rights over the common stockholders. And then their debt instruments, these are, you know, other types of investment, promissory notes, bonds, debentures, I guess, I, I well, I guess, yeah, investments. Because, because at some point, the whole idea is you are expecting some type of a return. So then we have our Securities and Exchange Commission. This is the a federal administrative agency charged with the rulemaking, enforcement, and adjudication of federal securities laws. This keeps everybody in check. And this may seem like a very uh, innocent thing that we're talking about, buying and selling enough securities. I mean, why would there be, why would we need to have any enforcement uh, or federal adjudication. Well, we're going to take a look at that as we move along in this class. Unlike many administrative agencies, the SEC is an independent, independent agency that does not have a seat in the cabinet, is not subject to direct control by the president. And that's probably a good thing right about now. We, <laughs> we want to make sure that, you know, the market is free from influence by, by a president who really likes to buy and sell stocks and all these kinds of things, which is a good thing. Okay, and so our book talks about, for me, two main statutes that relate to this particular subject. The Securities Act of 1933, which mandates a registration filing. So if you're going to offer your stock out there on the market to capitalize your business, you're going to have to file a registration. That's really what this Securities Act of 1933 is all about. You just can't be going out there, getting on the stock market, and just saying, hey, my, my, go buy my stock. No. The government has to take a look at this. I mean, what if this business is just like some sham thing, you know? That's the whole point of this organization is to protect people from going, I mean, you don't want to go out there and just spend your money on something turn, come to find out it's like, yeah. it's not what it says it is, you know. So that is the whole point. You have to register. And then you have to make certain disclosures. And then the SEC is going to look at that. And they're going to see if it's, you know, if this is not some fly by night, if it's all on up and up, then they're going to say, okay, okay. And so here our book gives us a nice little chart here. And these are the phases of securities reg uh, registration. So the first thing is you're going to have your pre-registration phase. The proposed issuer assembles pre-registration documents such as letters of intent, comfort letters, and an underwriting agreement. And then phase two is the registration statement. The proposed issuer drafts the prospectus with disclosures. This is going to tell us how strong the strength of this business. What kind of business is it? This is then going to be submitted to the SEC. Then in phase three, the SEC reviews the registration statement over a period of 10 days. If everything goes well, the SEC may either issue a, ref well, if things don't go well, the SEC will issue a refusal order during the 10 day, you have that 10 day review period. And then they'll let the person know, hey, there's some problems with this. 
maybe they will fix whatever the problem is and they will re uh, submit those documents. Or the SEC may take no action, in which case registration becomes effective 20 days after the original SEC file. So this is a nice little layout of how that uh, works. There are some instances, we're talking about small businesses, small capitalization uh, 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 types of transactions that may be exempt from registration. So you do have those. And your book tells you that most businesses do uh, file under an exempt status. But if you're Google or Apple, or you're not going to be able to do that. I mean, the, the government is going to come looking for you if you, you're, I mean, we're, we're talking about massive amounts of money that we're trying to raise in that particular instance. And then your book gives you some examples of securities that are exempt. So, you, I mean, when it's a commercial paper, I mean, we're talking about like, a loan. Securities of charitable organizations. So these are going to be some exempt. Some instances where registration, the, the uh, company will not have to register necessarily. And then now, here we come to our Securities Act of 1934. See, this is the part that regulates the sale of securities between investors after investor purchases it from a business entity issuer. Because funny little business goes on after this particular uh, process. Once, it, once it's out there in the market, it's no longer with under the guidance of the SEC. The SEC is going to, they're going to review the initial stages so that the uh, business can register that stock. But after that point, they're out there in the market. And so you got to have some, you got to act with some type of ethics at that point. Yes, ma'am. Is that why the Fiduciary Act came into being last year where they cracked down on Lord Abbott and stuff like that? So okay, so when you say Fiduciary Act, Act, what do you mean? Like, what, what's the... They, um, I, okay, I think I know what you're talking about. There are some, there are different, you know, there are different things out there where you have, like the whole thing with AIG and all the different, the bears, you know, yeah. you know, people that are allowing people to go out there and you know, get mortgages for homes they know that they can't um, pay for, and then they come in and, you know, they... Yeah, last year there was a huge um, who to do about the Fiduciary Act and the fact that it had been, like, beefed up because, well, Lord Abbott got their hands smacked, AIG got their hands smacked because they were doing stuff that wasn't basically, they were selling stocks and bonds that weren't basically in the best interest right. of the person. Is that because yes. of the Security Exchange Act? Is, it, is that why the Fiduciary Act got beefed up last year? You're calling the Fiduciary, I think I know what you're talking about, the name okay, of it. Okay, maybe, yeah. maybe I, well, yeah, I Yeah, but it has I to do with, with all yeah. this has to do with uh, being, you know, because uh, they have a fiduciary duty. Duty, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. To, Dodd Frank, that's what she's talking. That's what you're talking about, yeah, Dodd Frank. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And after that, every I, I worked for Ameriprise Financial, and mm -hmm. we just we got like, oh yeah, you know, because like, now you have to go through all different kinds. Oh of, yeah, the hoops yeah. have so changed. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. you got to dance. The yes, way. yes. Okay. So yes, that is absolutely the reason why. So. Okay. And so here's another little. Thing that people like to do, a little insider trading, which is illegal. <laughs> and I think sometimes people think that, you know, 
I just think that in this day and age, there are really no secrets. I mean, you think you're talking to somebody over a secure line, and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> if you, you know, if somebody who is the issuer of some stock has some inside information about their company, and they know that their friend bought some stock, that friend can't call them up and say, who to who? <laughs> what you know? And then they go and sell that stock before the price plummets. No, that's illegal. And you'll see that you can go to jail for that. Yes, ma'am. Wasn't that kind of like they were thinking that's what happened with the, was it Equifax tax? I heard a theory, I don't know if it was ever like in okay. the or called, but that they heard some insider training on the stock, and so they put that rumor out that it was hacked. So everyone jumped ship on the Equifax stock. What? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if it was like true. I saw like a, on Facebook. Really? Oh, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you know what? True. You know what? You, know what? you, I have a friend, and she'll call me up sometimes. She'll be like, girl. Did you, did you hear? I'm like, what? You know, she'll be like, girl, so and so and so. And I'll be like, where? What channel? What? Where'd you hear that? I saw it on Facebook. <laughs> it was some article, but I didn't. It was like right when it was beginning to happen. Okay. And well, I don't know. I'm gonna have to wait and see on this. Uh, but I, I see that people do get their news from Facebook. <laughs> My friend, she, I mean, I'd be like, hello, what's going on? What? <laughs> and come find out, she saw it on Facebook. <laughs> well, let's hold on and let me see. I mean, that sounds very interesting, but I haven't heard that. But that would be, but, but no, but let me just tell you that, the, okay, so the Equifax hack really did happen, though. You do realize that? Yeah. Okay. So, but like that, it was like conspired to happen that way. Everybody would pull out. Oh my! Well, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, the games. Interesting. Well, I'll have to go look that up on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So a and so there's a section 10B. This is where people get stung. Section 10B of the 1934 Act is the primary anti-fraud provision covering trading of securities. It makes it a criminal offense, criminal, <laughs> to engage in any fraud directly or indirectly in connection with the purchase and sale of any security. It has to be that the person intended to do so. So here we are. Mm -hmm. Now, does anybody remember this case? Yes. That is what this case was all about. Poor <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Oh, I'm sorry. She got busted for lying about it. Yeah. And that was funny because yeah. that was rumor going around for like not, years yeah. is that she right. got busted for insider trading. And then you read the chapter and was like, oh, it was obstruction of justice. So that's the thing, you know. But look, but let's say, okay, let's, okay, well, I'm going to come back to you and then I'm going I'm to see if she got busted for it or not. Okay, so let's. She did serve time. <laughs> Well, 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 I, I'm just saying there may be a yeah, decision. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm bad. Bad. <laughs> I, I bought her bed collection, yeah. <laughs> well, she's still rich. I mean. Yeah. And she did well when she was in jail. Yeah. $45,000. And I was like, why wouldn't you just choose to just say whatever and chuck it out the wall? Let me back in. go into all of the facts of this, we're really going to deal with count nine of the indictment, okay? She was 
found guilty in that trial. Now, let's just be clear. She was found guilty in that trial of several counts, including this count nine, which deals with insider trading. She was found guilty of that in the trial court stage of the case. She appealed the conviction and the court overturned only count nine of the indictment. Okay, so she really was busted for it. I like that word. She really was busted for it, but on appeal, the court overturned that particular count of the indictment. Okay. Okay, so char uh, count nine of the indictment charges that the defendant Stewart made materially false statements of fact regarding her sale of M clone securities with the intention of defrauding and deceiving investors by slowing or stopping the erosion or the value of the securities issued by her own company. Which to me, I kept reading this and I just couldn't see how they got there. But okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So did, did Martha Stewart herself own stock in M clone? M -clone she owns her business own She stock? owned stock in M she okay, so Martha Stewart herself, herself owned M clone stock. What some people don't know about Martha Stewart is before she became the homemaker extraordinaire, she, she yeah, she was she knew a lot about investments and so she was very savvy. Uh, she is very savvy in this area. Yeah. So she knows all about this. Okay. So so this is the allegation is that she sold the stock to so that it so that it would not have an effect on the stock of her own company. Which I anyway, okay. And so the court says, I have concluded that no reasonable juror could find. See, that's the thing. In a criminal case, the standard is, is beyond, it's not the preponderance of evidence like it is in a civil case. The standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. You got to bring proof beyond a reasonable doubt that she did this thing that you're saying that she did. Remember our elements. The last element is with intent. Okay, signed her. Okay, so uh, so I, that's why I'm saying I don't see. All I see is that she found out that the stock was slipping. She wanted to sell it before it got any lower because she would have lost more money. I don't see how they can prove that she sold it with the intent that she intentionally made statements or that she intentionally uh, 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 omitted saying something so that it would not have a value, so that it would not devalue her stock in her own, the own company that she owned. See, this is where they, they, they went they too reaching. far. <laughs> yeah, they reached too far there. Okay. And so here, in order to find the essential element of criminal intent beyond a reasonable doubt, a rational juror would have to speculate in this case. There was not enough evidence, and so they uh, brought down the facts. The criminal charges against Stewart, and this is her, the guy that, who was her stockbroker, arose from her December 27, 2001 sale of approximately 4,000 shares of stock in Inclone. Inclone is a biotechnology company whose then chief executive officer, Mr. Waxall, was a friend of Martha Stewart. And a client, okay, so this guy who is the CEO of this company is friends with Martha Stewart and he is also a client of Martha Stewart's stockbroker. Okay. Okay. So on December 28, 2001, the day after Stewart sold her, her shares, Enclome announced 
that the FDA had rejected the company's application for approval of a cancer fighting drug. That had been previously described as this lead product. So when they go and do their prospectus and all the information that they need to put in there to register their stock, they're gonna, this is some of the information, this is their, they have this, this drug and it's a cancer fighting drug and you know, all of this is going into prospectus so that people can know what they're buying when they buy this stock. But now the FDA is saying, no, we're rejecting the application for approval well, that stock is going to go through the floor. So, obviously, if they're friends, and then somebody going to call somebody and say, hey. The indictment alleges that on the morning of December 27, 2001, that the stockbroker learned that Waxhaw and several of his family members were selling. So, obviously, he would know that they're selling their stock. Why? Because he is their stockbroker as well. So obviously, if he knows they're selling their stock, is he going to tell his friend Martha Stewart that they're selling their stock? Yeah. No? Did you say no? <laughs> you don't think her longtime stockbroker is going to call her up and say, hey, these people are selling their stock. What you want to do? Aye, okay. <laughs> well, that's what he did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the stockbroker allegedly instructed his assistant to inform Stewart. See, he didn't do the dirty work. He had his assistant come to inform student Stewart of the Waxhaw's trading activity and she sold her shares in response to that information. According to the indictment, the defendants then lied about the real reason for Stewart's sale in order to cover up what was possibly an illegal trade and to deflect attention from Stewart in the ensuing investigations into uh, suspicious and clone trading in advance of the uh, announcement that the FDA was gonna reject that application. The defendants claimed that they had a standing agreement. So the defendants, Martha Stewart and her stockbroker, are saying they had a standard agreement, a standing agreement <coughs> that Stewart would sell her stock at any time that that stock fell below the price of $60 per share. So count nine of the indictment charged Stewart, the CEO of Martha Stewart Living. I forget the name of her company, but oh, it's right there. Where is media or something? Yeah, it's some. It is. She she has this whole thing here because it's, it's supposed to be some big media. Where online? Is it online? Right there in the right there, right there. On the on the last one. Go back. No, it's, yeah, right on the left. Right there. The, the first purple paragraph. Right okay, right Martha Living um, Omni Media because it's like books and magazines and online and blah, 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 all kinds of things. So uh, the count is based on three repetitive public statements she made in June of 2002 after media began reporting investigations of her income trade. So you know when the media finds out about anything, they're going to go ballistic on you. And what I usually tell people uh, who are my clients, I tell them, keep your mouth closed. Sometimes people just think they need to talk, 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 talk. No, you don't need to say anything. You have the right to remain silent. But then she goes out there, and she doesn't do one statement, not two, but she does three. <laughs> After you make one statement, and that's not good enough, and you are writing up the second statement, you need to stop yourself. But that sometimes people have, it, 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 when you talk to Martha Stewart, uh, somebody did a good, uh, what's the name of that guy in Hollywood who has the, uh, that show, he did a good uh, show on her recently. She's still mad about it. <laughs> She's upset about that thing. And I'm like, girl, you went out there and you told all your business. <laughs> Why are you mad? 
Okay, so the Supreme Court has held that scientor, see, here we go. We have our elements, and this court is just dealing with scientor because you have to have all three elements. And this court believes that scientor is missing, intent. Scientor or intent in the civil securities fraud context indicates a mental state embracing intent to deceive, manipulate, or defraud, and is a required element of any claim of securities fraud. In the criminal prosecution, the government must also prove that the defendant acted willfully, that is, with the realization that she was acting wrongfully. The government contends that the intent requirement is no different in criminal law. This is where the problem is here. You can have two types of suits under this particular statute. Uh, they can be civil or they can be criminal. And so sometimes the government will try to use the lesser standard, the preponderance of evidence standard to prove up intent. Any good lawyer will say, no, this is dealing with a person's liberty. You are in a criminal court. You need to prove intent beyond a reasonable doubt. And then the court says, uh, whether taking into account the heightened standard of proof in criminal cases, there is sufficient evidence of Stewart's intent to deceive investors to present the matters to the jury. So that's the issue that the court is dealing with. The issue at hand is not which definition of intent to apply, to apply, but whether taking into account the heightened standard of proof in criminal cases, there is sufficient evidence of her intent to deceive investors. To deceive investors, okay? Investors of her own stock, okay? So the court goes through the evidence that the state tries to say is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And so they talk about the prospectus. And I am just highlighting this point here because, you know, this is one of the things that is talked about in our chapter. The prospectus of Martha Stewart's company uh, states that Martha Stewart, as well as her name, her image, her trademarks, and other intellectual property rights, which we're coming up on in our next chapter relating to these, are integral to their marketing efforts and form the core or the brand. The prospectus con uh, goes on to say that our continued success and the value of our brand name therefore depends to a large degree on the reputation of Martha Stewart. So they're trying to tie this all together. They're trying to say if she's the type of person that's doing insider trading, then that's going to have some uh, diminished value on her own company. That's what they're trying to loop this thing together. And to me, it's a little loose, but they're able to convict her. So, okay. Also, that the share price of Martha Stewart's company began to fall on June 7, 2002. So these are all little pieces they're putting together to try to say that she's, that she's making these statements. See. She sells the, the, the stock after getting this information to try to save her company's value from diminishing. She goes and she puts these statements out to clean up what people are saying she did because they're saying that if she doesn't do that, if she doesn't make these what they call false statements, the sale of her own company is going to go through the floor. So they talk about the statements that she makes. So the first statement appeared in the Wall Street Journal on June 7th. And it says, according to her attorney, Ms. Stewart's sale involving about 3,000 shares of Enclome occurred on December the 26th, 27th. The sale was executed, he said, because 
because Miss Stewart had a predetermined price at which she planned to sell the stock. To me, that's a good story right there. That determination made more than a month before that trade, you know, they're trying to make it look real good here. That she always decided that if that stock fell below $60, she was going to sell it. So it was not that she heard through the grapevine that the company was going to, it's just so happened that she sold her stock before that happened, but it's just, that just happened to be what happened. The, she sold it because the price fell, not because she had any information. Okay, so the second statement appeared in a press release issued after the close of business on June 12th. It says, I want to reiterate. Don't reiterate, just keep your mouth closed. If you have to reiterate, you're in trouble. I want to reiterate the facts surrounding. See, when you start reiterating, you're not really reiterating. You start adding stuff. The facts surrounding my sale of the income stock. I purchased 5,000 shares, so she starts giving more information. I originally purchased 5,000 shares several years ago in the public market. I tendered all of these shares uh, see, she's trying to fix it here. So she says, I tendered all these shares in the $70 per share tender offer made by Bristol. So Bristol Myers made a tender offer. She tendered her all of hers in that particular transaction uh, to all public shareholders of Enclone in October 2001 because Bristol Myers' offer was oversubscribed. I was able to sell only about 20% of the shares, so she still had about 4,000 left. So then at that point in time, uh, she was able to determine that, okay, I have a price in my mind. Okay, I, at this time I could sell them for 70, but so I know they're worth about 70. So if they fall below 60 at any given point in time, that's when I want to sell. So on December 27th, I returned a call from my broker. Okay. I don't know if she meant her broker or her broker's assistant. I, I don't know. But I wouldn't say I would I I wouldn't say any of that because it's kind of that's how her broker is now in the lawsuit with her. They both get convicted in the, in, in the criminal case. My broker advising me that Mclone had fallen below $60. I read in my instructions to sell the shares. The trade was promptly executed at $58 per share. I did not speak to Mr. Samuel Wasco regarding my sale and did not have any non-public information regarding Mclone when I sold my shares. After the blah, 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 blah. See, when you start doing all of this right here, people can break into your iPhone, the government, and find out. So at some point in time, you know, the fact of the matter is, <laughs> to make a long story short, They were able to determine that. See, the, the government. They, they were able to determine that she was that she was really lying about all of this. However, the count nine, the actual intent to. So she makes. Okay. So after the close of business, June 18, Ms. Stewart issued a third statement. Essentially, repeated the June 12 statement, only adding that the company went up. The following day, she read that. June 18th statement with no changes at a mid-year review conference. See, this is where they're making the, the case now that she is, because this is all you need, these are the elements. All you need are the three elements and the intent at the end to defraud investors of, of your stock. So she's, so they're going through all of the statements that she made, but the court is like, no. The court starts doing an analysis. They say, as for the first statement, the government has prevented no evidence that her lawyer 
reached out to the Wall Street Journal, okay? You go out and you put a press release out there and the Wall, Wall Street Journal prints it, it's, that's their business. It's not like I call the Wall Street Journal and say, hey, this is what I want you to put in the Wall Street Journal. It's a business periodical. And so that is what they're concerned with. She makes a public statement. It's just a press release. And they printed it. So the court says, no, I mean, does that gonna, is that going to have the, the right amount of, amount of intent to deceive? You just put a statement out there in the atmosphere. And so they go through that whole analysis. And then in the end, what they end up doing is finding that the government had not proved beyond a reasonable doubt that she had the requisite intent to defraud her investors. Okay, but you can see how um, you can get into a lot of trouble, not the insider trading itself. The insider trading itself should have been enough if they were able to prove it. <laughs> but also they were able to get her on the fact that she made these statements after the fact with the intent to deceive her own investors to keep the price of her own stock up. So there are a lot of different ways that this particular statute can be implicated. And so I'm going to go back and just do one question just to see. So this is going to be our question here. Okay. All in all, okay, <laughs> do you really think Martha Stewart should have been convicted and incarcerated since the Court of Appeals ultimately found that the United States did not meet all the elements of count nine? I mean, some people are concerned with the fact that she did lie, but did she need to be convicted of violation of the Securities Act, uh, or does she need to be convicted and incarcerated? I mean, she's really upset about it, so I think she would want to know what your answer is. She's still upset about it. So yeah, we're going to send her our answers. So wait, let me go back. I got to think about it. A, yes. B, no. Right. I mean, really? I think that sometimes the government can, you know, find a big fish and they'll go after that person with the vengeance. And I really don't know what the big deal was. I mean, she only spent a few months in there. She did a lot of pottery and getting <laughs> carried on. Oh. The place didn't even have a, a fence around it. Oh, did they? <laughs> you're a federal president. Uh, yes, ma'am. That's not a really good question because I, I was reading the chapter and I understand the, the okay. context of the, the concept of okay. the tipper, tip E. Uh -huh. uh, but to me, because it was her, it was the, hold on, because I'm forming his thoughts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the Wascow dude somehow alerted the other guys to the fact that he was selling those shares. But if a broker has a fiduciary duty to its investors, then if I know this information, regardless of how I know it, don't I have a fiduciary duty to you to let you know anyway? Like, I feel like that's not an a, a insider trading so much as that's me just doing my job. Like, it'd be different if I went and sought out the information. No, 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 hold on now. Listen, in that particular role, if you're seeing out on the market that the price is falling for whatever reason or that you may have some information, but you can't have people who are issuers of that same stock, you're the stockbroker for them, 
you know they're selling their stock, and then you go call other people who you have sold that stock to? No, you can't so do that. So what if he wasn't a stockbroker? And instead, they was friends, and they were at a dinner party at Waskow's house, and they were all sitting around the table, and Waskow says, yeah, you know, the FDA didn't approve that drug. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then the person goes and gets on the phone, you know, behind the corner and says, hey, Martha Sillage, you know, let me change shares or whatever. Like, I don't know. That could be different. Because I'm just, like, really trying to get what they really consider. Because they were saying, like, there could be a tippy of a tippy and, like... <laughs> That could be different, but I don't know. I just don't think that you can, you know, if a person, I'm assuming, if they don't, if there can be proof that nobody knew that this guy, who is a friend of Martha Stewart, didn't know that she had bought that stock and he's making that statement, that could be one thing, but they're friends. She, he knows she owns their stock. I mean, they, She's, he sold it to her. Well, he didn't sell it to her, but they're friends. If I'm, if I, if I have some stock, I have a company, a good company, and we're friends. No. Aren't you gonna buy my stock? Stock in my company? We're friends. You know I'm out there on the market and I'm selling stock in my company. You're not gonna buy some of my stock. <laughs> I'm rich. <laughs> I mean, I was just saying, you're my rich friend, Marsha. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Right. And I know that you bought it. We're we're friends. Right. Not only that, we have the same stockbroker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they really it's, had her. I mean, eh. <laughs> I mean, friends talk about stocks all the time. I mean, yeah. you should have seen how we talked at Ameriprise about stocks that would rise and fall and stuff like that. And stocks that, you know, we all owned mm -hmm. and stuff. We, we, I, have yeah. just, I have three different stock market chains yes, on you my may phone own, Yes, you may own oh. some stock, but but you're not the right, issuer. Right. I'm not I mean, the I'm talking about the issuer. I mean, I am issuing stock to capitalize my company. Yeah. Martha, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, that's different. So because of then, the boss now. Then all of us having like, oh, you got some AIG? Yeah, I got some AIG. How do you feel, girl? Yeah, my AIG. Why your AIG? No. No. Okay. I, let's just say you have bought some of my Martha Stewart stuff. Okay. I mean, we're friends. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go over and buy some of your in-clone stuff. You know? Something happens to my company, I'm sitting around, I'll be like, yeah, the FDA is going to reject that, you know. You got to be careful. Because tippy, tippy, tipper, all of y'all be in jail together, tipping, right. tipping each other. <laughs> a tip of a tip. Trust me, jail is not fun. <laughs> There's nothing worse than waking up one day, and you put your little slippers on, think you're going to go outside and get the paper and realize, oh, Lord, I can't go nowhere. <laughs> That's terrible, you know. Back, back, in the, back in my past, 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 past life, I used to work at a prison. And you go through one gate and the thing closed behind you. And that closed behind you, then you go through another gate. That one closed behind you. <laughs> you go through three layers of gates to get in the place. And after eight hours, I'm looking around, all the inmates, they running around and they're having fun, doing their little thing, and I'm sitting locked up somewhere in one spot watching some people. After, I'm like, wait a minute, am I in prison? Who's in prison? <laughs> They said most CLs feel like that. Like they asked yeah. a bunch of them. They was like, I feel like I'm in prison. Like, yeah. I don't it's, get weapons. I don't. It's not fun, people. So, in all, so these are things that we need to know. I mean, in business, sometimes people are just doing things innocently, just yeah. innocently. You think Martha Stewart thought, ever thought, yeah, by calling her friend mm -hmm. about that stock? She claims she never talked to him, but somebody <laughs> called somebody. So, so we have to be careful. That's a crime, okay? Are there any questions?